Howdy folks, Brian Cusco here at Triple B again, still at the Tinley Reptile Park show. And today we've got Rich Crowley, who is an amazing keeper. Uh, you could say maybe he wrote a book on short-tailed pythons, maybe you could say that. Uh, and he's going to talk to us today about his keeping and specifically show us some really cool short-tailed blood pythons. You're watching Triple B TV. How long have you been working with snakes? Oh my gosh. Well, I've been working with snakes, I'll probably say 45 years. 40 45 years. years? Yeah. I want to say the first snake I've ever got, as a, obviously as a kid, I was probably not even 10 years old. Okay. So I'm, and I'm an old guy, so All right. yeah, we it's don't, a long we time. don't look that old. Yeah, so I'll be 53 next month. So okay, puts me, you know, shave off that hair and. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, I actually, you know, growing up in the Midwest, so I had family down in Southern Illinois, so we made pilgrimages down there a couple times a year at Snake Road and all the places down in that Shawnee area. So you got fox snakes and corn snakes and um, had my first uh, hot encounter with a uh, Southern Copperhead. I think I was 14 at the time. Uh, down at camp. So, you know, snakes are always my passion. But I also got into uh, keeping in, uh, amphibians and invertebrates probably long before I started actually breeding reptiles. So, and when I kind of worked in with. Uh, that was probably, I think I started in keeping, I think it was the first ball python I got was in college. Um, so, I think. All told, I think I've probably been breeding in earnest for 25 years, um, and it was ball pythons and short tail pythons. Those are the I like that sort of that meaty, stout-bodied look on a snake. And I've done, you know, I was into bearded dragons and a lot of the commercial mainstream stuff early on. So uh, I've had a number of experiences doing that, and then you know I did rescue. That's where actually I spent most of my reptile experience over my life is providing uh, education, outreach, and rescue for, you know, the certainly the Midwest area. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. That's Good awesome, point. man. That's Still good. doing it to this day, you know. Sweet. Is that, is, so reptiles, is this your full-time deal? It's or? not. No, I wish it was. I'd maybe one of, I'm trying to make it one of these days, but uh, I'm a financial professional. Um, I've been working uh, in the government contracting world for almost 25 years. Um, I was in industry for about almost 10 years before that. So my, I'm an accountant by profession who just wanted to really get into biology. Everybody talked me out of it. And I learned now, don't listen to what other people tell you. <laughs> do what you want. Uh, and that's why I tell people. I said, do what you want. I've been very fortunate. I, you know, still found a way to get back into what I think was my passion, which was dealing with, you know, reptiles and amphibians and, and animals in general. Um, I certainly have more means. I think if I went like the zoological route, not making a lot of money, as unfortunately our zookeepers and, and professional staff in the zoos are, don't make a lot. Um, but you know, here I can actually help them out, and um, and I get the sense of being almost like having my own private zoo with all the animals I have. So yeah, no doubt. So it's, is it mostly short tails at this point, or I have every I have a little bit of everything. Um, my wife is also an animal enthusiast, and she's also a business professional. So it's kind of wild that two get together, and we didn't have herps at the time when we met, even though we had them growing up. It was just a weird uh, time frame in both of our lives. We just, we had fish. That was it. And it was uh, during the dating scene, we'd go out to pet stores to go stock up. And we got back into it. Of all things, we bought a pair of baby diamondback water snakes. And those little rippers, pulled us back in and you know she helped me do uh, uh, the support that I did for the Chicago Herpological Society for oh my, now over 25 years and she, you know we rescued animals and um, we even have our original sulcata tortoise that we got in 95. You say now, Char? You're involved with Char? Uh, Is that what you said? No, with the Chicago Herpological oh, Society. Oh gosh, you got, okay, yeah. okay. Sorry, sorry. 
Um, but that's, you know, my wife's been supportive of me getting involved with that, you know, doing these events, you know, so it's been, it's been great. You got to have a family support group. Yeah, so, I agree. But you yes. know, yeah, yeah, yes. you've got it. Absolutely. So, um, but yeah, it's been, it's been a fun ride. And the short-tailed pythons are probably, of all the species I've interacted with, with maybe the exception of uh, monitors, I love monitors as well, and I kept a number of them, but I'd never bred monitors. Uh, to me, that was just it, the opportunity it hadn't presented itself. But with the short-tailed pythons, it was easy. I, I, I got into them back in 94, uh, was when I first got a taste of keeping short-tailed pythons. I saw that, I thought that was really cool, and endeavored to get more. And then one day I just decided, I got enough of them, let's, let's try breeding. And not been disappointed. Uh, it's been a great experience. It's a great community. Uh, anybody who's kept short tail pythons, and I know you've got yours, you know, it's a, it's a different snake. It's, it's got different personality. Um, but they're it's much like, more aware than people give them credit for. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They're, they're calculating. I, they're looking at you. They may not give you an instantaneous response, but you can tell there's something going on behind there. They're probably trying to plot the take over the world or something. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> that's, that's, that's good. That's what it looks like when you actually pay attention to how their eyes work. And it, it, it's something along those lines. Yeah, they're, they're, up, they're up to a revolt. Just give it time. <laughs> I know it's going to happen. <laughs> well, you brought some short tails. I think we should check them out. Uh, definitely. So, well, I'm going to start out by talking about the one that probably I'm more known for is the Sarawaks. Okay. That, because am I, am I correct? You you introduced these into the hobby. Is that accurate? I did not. No. I'm kind of I'm like an early entrant into it. Okay. Um, these original the Sarawax originally um, acquired by the Barkers, David Tracy Barker, gotcha. in the uh, mid 1990s, and it was Chris Carmichael who uh, actually captive bred them for the first time. And uh, Chris has uh, continued to you know be um, an inspiration for me because of his uh, academic focus and his twin brother, who I know really well, Rob Carmichael, who was a good friend of mine, um, is actually the one who steered me towards getting a pair originally from his brother. So, um, and I've been breeding them you know, from probably 2003 on. Um, I've been successful with keeping the Sarawaks. I kind of took a spell away from them for a while. Um, Mainly because I think the hobby quite wasn't ready for having such an unusual short tail python, and, but now short tail pythons are coming back with with vigor, and hopefully we can continue to keep the Sarawaks, you know, in captivity. Um, there's not many of them out there, and there's not a lot of people actually actively breeding with them. So now, what what makes a Sarawak a Sarawak? So. They're a darker um, variety of the Borneo. Um, this one's actually very light. They get much, much darker as they get older, almost uh, melanistic by most standards. Uh, the texture of them is distinctly different than a typical Borneo. If you can feel the scales are a little bit more bubbled. Yeah. And as they get bigger, that becomes more and more pronounced. Um, not as extreme as like an Angolan Python, but it's got that really cool texture to it. Um, that's the most obvious. Uh, the second part is they get really, really dark. And um, it's hard. I wish I had the adult female that I have that it shows you how black they get. Uh, very similar to like a Sumatran short tail python. Okay, so like as a blood python gets more and more red, these get would get more and more dark as... Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, this one's only... This is a, a 2019. Um, this is actually a young one that uh, was a slow starter. Um, so this will get darker. Um, the Sarawaks also, my experience, they're more sexually dimorphic. Usually short-tailed pythons, there's not much variation between the males and the females over the long run. The males on the Sarawaks definitely stay small, like around five foot, and my females will push over six and a half feet. So, I mean, a big difference there. Um, they're fun. I mean, they're, they're not for everybody because it's a, a, it's a locality. Um, there was some early work done by Chris Carmichael on sort of the DNA and looking at how much very how much difference or how much um, similarities they have to Borneos and there was enough there to pretty pretty much an argument in there. They could be separated, but there's not enough work that's been done to support that as gotcha. of yet. So I don't know if it ever will. But I definitely uh, recommend anybody who gets one to keep them separate from 
regular Borneos. Um, they're, they're different. Um, I know there's been, uh, I don't want to call it hybridization, but breeding between the Borneos and the Sarawaks, and they really don't do it any justice. The Sarawaks on their own are, are fascinating in their own right. This guy's pretty active, too, so. Yeah. He knows he's on camera. <laughs> do you notice any temperamental difference between them, or? Um, I notice that they like it cooler temps. That's the most, like, the second most obvious thing about them. But as far as personalities go, they're not much different than any other short tail python. Um, they could be laid back. Um, there was some earlier um, lines produced by a couple early keepers. Um, that definitely demonstrated the inheritance of the personality from parents down to the siblings. And there was a couple of uh, uh, lines that actually were, they were more high strung, I would say even a little bit more nippy. Um, fortunately, uh, those lines really didn't hold real well. And the ones that I'm working with right now are originating from the lines I, I've been working with and they're all laid back. Um, yeah, it looks like it. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, this was actually, I, I, picked, I got this from um, a customer, a customer of mine who bought my, who bought some Sarawaks for me originally, and he actually gave this one to me because he was having a hard time getting it to eat. Finally got to eat, and he thought he thought uh, it would be able to help spur a little bit more production of Sarawaks if I had it in my hands so I can pair it up with a female in my group. That's great. So, but that's a Sarawak. Awesome. Yeah. What was that other animal you got over so, there? So, anybody who's been in the scene on blood pythons know there's. There's a bunch of different morphs out there, not as uh, numerous as ball pythons, but this is one that came in, that I produced uh, a clutch of. Um, there were, this is called a nebula. That was uh, branded and named by me. Uh, the nebula is uh, made up of several different uh, inheritable genes. Um, the key component on this was a wild gene that I suspected was gonna produce more of what I think is a calico look on the side. That's very unusual for uh, blood pythons, at least the ones that we're seeing now in captivity. And then this one also has a VPI line of genetic striping, which is very, extremely variable. And uh, it also is a uh, het for the uh, hypo and the T-positive uh, albino gene. So. Uh, Unfortunately, for people who are interested in new morphs, this one's not going to be available for a while until I uh, do a couple more breedings to see the range of the inheritance of this. And is that is that genetic striping kind of more of a uh, line line bred trait versus? Uh, it's it's attributable to its VPI line genetics, but there's a lot of different. You know, blood pythons have genetic striping sort of naturally. Right. Um, but some of the genetic striping out there, VPI is one of them that has um, certain characteristics of that striping. And I think this one's got more of what I call a keyhole effect, where you've got striping, but you've got an open pattern inside there. And I think that actually enhances. So um, I think it'll be interesting to see. This one is about six months old now. Um, is to see where you see the darker brown coloration, I'm expecting that's going to come through as very dark red. And then it'll be interesting to see how the rest of the pattern, especially on the Caloco part, how that passes through. Um, it does have a little bit of a, a different belly pattern. I haven't quite resolved myself on what that all is going to translate to as it gets older, but... As anybody who's kept short-tailed pythons, Borneos typically have no pattern. Um, same with the uh, Sumatrans, but the blood pythons have a patterned belly. And this one continues to keep pattern on there. Now here's a more general question for you. How do you look at this backbone and identify whether your snake is getting too fat or is too skinny? So there's a great uh, reference that I had in my book to give people sort of a visual on that one. And they have a very prominent backbone. And I tell people, you always look to make sure that that backbone is mostly visible throughout the body. Um, it should have sort of a, almost like a, a raindrop or dewdrop look where you see that 
spike on the top and then it flares out, that's usually a good sign that you've got good shape. Um, certainly you don't want it to be so emaciated where you feel the ribs. There should be good muscle tone. Um, you know, with snakes, the fat is on the inside of the rib cage, not on the outside. So when you do start feeling that sponginess in any, in any of the snake species, especially blood pythons, that means the fat's, there's fat underneath the skin. That's too much. Um, and these guys do so much better on the lean side rather than overweight side. And that's, I think, a lot of the mistakes that happen early on in the hobby with breeding short tail pythons, why so many did not succeed was because we often overfed them, you know. And for females especially, you could actually um, put them at risk of egg binding and, and impaction and stuff like I that. I think that's probably true of most python species. They're, oh, yeah, they're yeah. much yeah. slower metabolism. It's not like the colubrids that people were keeping. I think people were trying to feed them like colubrids maybe when they first got them. Yeah, and they, you can't do that. And with short-tailed pythons especially, um, you know, they are so efficient in producing the, you know, uh, the energy out of their food. I feed mine at three to four week cycles, and they still gain weight, still grow, um, and of course, you know, the, their reputation for their anal retentiveness is <laughs> very well known. So, you know, when anal they do retentiveness, <laughs> the epic, the epic tales of defecations and short tails, you know. <laughs> But oh man! Once you've lived one, it's it's you yeah. will never forget it. <laughs> Somebody wonders where the Saint Bernard came in and did a dump. <laughs> <laughs> so, but there is, and this, the, you know, the mystique around. Yeah, I call it the, not even the mystique, but I think the uh, the urban myth that you know short tail pythons are mean and nasty is really more attributable to stress management. And as you can tell, this one's really laid back, and this and it's inheritable. The parents definitely can pass that on. And this, the parents on both sides for this one were very, very laid back. Um, and that's something that, you know, sometimes I almost would rather breed for personality over the attractiveness or try to influence a little bit more of that uh, laid back nature um, when I'm breeding the animals, especially on some of the, I call them the entry level morphs, matrix, and some of the ones that are a little bit more um, they're more inexpensive for people to get into because it's easier to be able to deal with an animal that's this laid back. Um, and it's not to say that some of the farmed animals come in are not like that either, but they're usually so stressed by the time they come in, it's we don't give them a chance. Yeah. So, but that's that's the nebula, and hopefully we'll be able to see a little bit more of what these guys had to offer in years to come, especially as we start producing uh, animals with the uh, hypo and the, uh, the the T positive albino in there because I think that will just kick this up oh, in a yeah. couple steps. Absolutely. And I've got granite Borneos and that was one thing that this kind of reminded me of the speckling, the speckled sided. So it'll be interesting to see if the level of inheritance that makes that calico speckle siding with the Borneos, I see that different levels, it actually increases up the side to see if it does the same um, with the with the uh, nebulas. Um, and this one's got very interesting where the pattern, normally on short tails, you don't see the, the, vert, the vertebral pattern encroaching in on towards the lower sections. And this one, you see that across the board. It's almost like melting into the sides. It's gorgeous, man. Yeah, thanks. The hard part is you never want to get rid of any of them. You want to hold them all back, you know. <laughs> uh, no doubt, especially but. with a project that you're just starting and proving out. And, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. And there's so many projects out there. I mean, we're really at the cusp of, you know, the short tails kind of coming into their own these days. And I think um, one of the reasons that I kind of wrote the book a passionate journey on short tail pythons is really because I saw more and more people getting into it and they didn't want to make in sort of the mistakes that often people make is that they rely on bad information and you know and it's not all on me I mean it's I, I just compiled the book with the help of many great contributors into it and you know I, I still look forward to the book that hopefully Dave and Tracy Barker will release one of these days because I know everybody's been contributing to that and that will be a worthwhile uh, wait. Uh, just be excited to get that. Um, but the information has to be out there. Yeah. You know, if people are going to keep a species, you got to know about it. Um, and I think 
you know, the, the old school keeping it in a glass aquarium is just so wrong and doesn't work with these guys at all. Um, rack systems are great, tubs, you know, but they got to have that ability to maintain a, a good moderate climate, you know, ambient temperature, 78 to 82, you know, um, mo moderate humidity. I mean, I keep my ball pythons the same way. Yeah. So it's not, it's not difficult to keep them. Um, but it definitely is a challenge when you've got a, a six and a half foot long, 25 plus pound snake and if you know if they're not healthy that's a that's a handful to deal with yeah because these guys are little spring-loaded just powerhouses dude and yeah and they do jump yeah <laughs> <laughs> they literally jump <laughs> got a lot of power in them awesome well wh uh, where can people uh find if they want to follow what you're working on where can people do that uh, the, you know there's uh, obviously my website uh, richcrowleyreptiles.com uh, I'm on Instagram and, and Facebook under the same uh, so they can always follow me there um, I still continue to get actively involved in uh, US Arc and the Chicago Herpological Society so I always encourage people do what I've done is learn as much as you can so reach out to me if you got questions but also well, learn learn the proper way of keeping any reptiles before you get into them. So you leverage whatever knowledge you can get. And uh, I'm not the only one out there, which is great. So True, true. Well, hey, Rich, I, I appreciate you taking some time away from your booth to come down, sit and talk with us. I today, love man. it. Thank you, you really very dude. much. Yeah, Good thank learn. you, dude. Appreciate it. All right, thank you, Rich, for sitting down with us, man. I'm a big fan of what you're doing over there. And uh, you guys, if you want to join in a Zoom call with Rich tonight, we'll be doing that. There's a link down in the description if you want to find out how. And uh, hopefully we'll see you there tonight. If not, we'll see you next week right here on Triple B TV. Y'all take care. So how do you how do you want to do it as far as the, uh, with the snakes and stuff like that? Um, what, do you, what do you mean? Does it make sense to just put them on the table, or you just want me to talk, or what? Um, yeah, you can put them on, and then we'll take we'll take them out. So I get some, I'll get some close-up shots with the uh, phone camera. Okay. So just save that to the end, maybe. Um, we'll, we'll pull them out sometime in the middle, I'd say. Okay. And this is a short process. It's like 10, 15 minutes. All right, not problem. Nothing. Uh, I know I, I started doing that because I know most of the people, pretty much all the people that I have on are vending as well. So like, I don't want to take people away from their table for an yeah. hour and a half. You know, right, what I mean? it just doesn't make sense. That's cool. Um,